Good afternoon, everyone here in the Blaue Zaal, and good afternoon, everyone in Teams. Welcome to this lunch lecture by Studium Generale. Welcome to Worm Technology, uh, a fitting topic perhaps for uh, this time of year. Very shortly, Worm Technology is a pr perspective for design uh, developed here at CUE uh, that puts people first, and in particular, people with dementia. Just a quick check here in the room. Could I ask you who of you uh, knows or has known a relative or, or someone else you're close to with dementia? Okay, well, I think that's about 75% of hands going up, um, which is perhaps not surprising because, um, yeah, dementia is certainly one of the most prominent challenges uh, of our time in terms of healthcare. Uh, it puts the healthcare, pre uh, healthcare sector under uh, more pressure than it is already. Um, but the good news is that designers and engineers uh, could play an important role in finding new solutions for these challenges. Uh, and worm technology could be the way to do so. So at the forefront of this development is Dr. Rens Brankaert. Uh, he's assistant professor here at CUE, um, assistant professor of active and healthy aging at the systematic change group uh, at industrial design. Um, he sets up and leads the TUE Expertise Center for Dementia and Technology. Uh, and earlier this year, he was awarded uh, the Young Outstanding Researcher Award for the uh, Dutch Alzheimer Foundation. Um, introducing us today to the possibilities of worm technology, please welcome Rens Brankaert. Thank you for that uh, introduction. Wonderful to be able to speak to people in a room again and not uh, on Teams to my screen. So uh, thanks for this invitation. Um, what I want to do today is to uh, introduce you to the research that we do regarding the topic of uh, warm technology. Um, it was already introduced that I work at TV. I always have a position, uh, also have a, a position at Fontes at the School of Allied Health Sciences and there uh, we tr I try to also combine the technology with the people with a healthcare um, background. Um, what I first will do is introduce you a little bit to the societal challenge that we are facing, why that we are setting up this uh, research, and also the center that was already mentioned. And uh, after that, I will uh, elaborate a little bit on the framing of warm technology and show you some examples of work that we have developed in research to, uh, well, to address this. But first, um, if my clicker works, yes. First, the team. So these are the researchers involved in our uh, research center. So the work that I present today is not, of course, uh, just from me. It's from an entire team um, behind there. And there's more people on the website, of course, uh, that support us as well. First, older adults. That's what we see and what we notice when we look at our society is that we are getting older as a society. And um, that's because we make all kinds of medical advancements. Um, and, and what we also see is that um, um, uh, so people live longer and also that we have to find a kind of way to involve people uh, uh, that are older in a good way in our society. Maybe the way how we were viewing that is not the way we should continue viewing that. And with this increase of people that are uh, aging, also chronic diseases get a higher incidence. Um, this is a number of uh, 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 older people in, uh, uh, in America, how it's projected to increase, and you really see steep increase of, of uh, older adults. That means also that our working force for uh, every older adult is, is decreasing. Yeah? So that means that we might also have to rearrange our uh, social systems a little bit. What we will focus on today is um, a, a subsection of that as people living with dementia was also already mentioned, that is really a focus of the research that we're doing and also a reason why we set up this framing of warm uh, technology. Um, as you might know, dementia is a progressive condition that affects the brain and slowly over time, uh, more, uh, the brain is more uh, affected. Um, this leads to, uh, for example, in the beginning, dealing with complex situations might be difficult. Memory is the most uh, familiar one. M memory gets affected. But also in the later stages of dementia, you can see that um, um, really self-care becomes a problem. Being able to live independently becomes a problem. And then uh, people often have to go to a formal care environment. But actually, this track of dementia is really long. It's not 
what you think, sometimes people think only of those later stages that people are really in need. No, but it can take really nine to 10 years. So that means that over the entire course of uh, the manifestation of something like dementia, we can support um, people um, with our ideas and with technology. So like I, uh, like I said, from uh, complexity challenges to really daily, uh, daily living challenges. And one of the things we have to be really careful about, this is a sign that I photographed when I was in Australia, is with the stigmatization of older adults and specifically people with dementia. We have a certain view in our society that people are unable, that they need to be cared for, and that they are not uh, 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 independent human beings like we, but that's of course not the case. So that's also a framing of inclusion that we take into our research. And we really involve all the people in the decisions that we make uh, in our research. One of the reasons why that we uh, work with technology for people living with dementia is uh, also because of news like this. Here it's stated in a news article in 2018 that the pharmaceutical industry is um, doing a step back on research for finding a cure for dementia because they don't see a profit margin in the next 10 to 15 years. And uh, that's because this uh, advancement of this finding a medicine is going really slow. Uh, of course, I hope they find it, and then we can really solve the problem in that way. But if you look at the research, that's really far away. And that means that this increase that, is, uh, that I just mentioned is coming. We need to find something to really support people that are living with dementia. We cannot just prevent it or uh, address it with medicine. So that is something uh, uh, where we can really play a role with our... Uh, technology. Um, and that means that we actually find uh, uh, in this, uh, this large playing field that is dementia, a lot of opportunities for technology and also for other uh, innovations. What I want to do now is to take you a little bit in the framing that we have that led to uh, warm technology, the perspectives that we uh, come from. First one is a really simple exercise. I googled technology for people with dementia. And then you ca uh, can see this screen. And what you immediately notice here is uh, the number of screens available here on this screen, right? So somehow we have, when we think of technology for this group, we think of applications on smart devices. Um, so there is a certain framing that this is the right way to, uh, to support people with dementia, while we know from research that actually smartphones are too difficult, too complex for this group. So that means we have to think in other ways than we are currently doing about supporting people with dementia with technology. It's another example here. Here you see an older person. He has a blood pressure meter on his arm, and he's interacting with a robot. It seems here that the designers of this robot were maybe more interested in, des in developing the robot than supporting this person in the op most optimal way. Here you see that the robot, what it apparently does, is holding a screen with a complex arm in the right position. Definitely important research. I'm not saying that it's not the case, but the framing that we take with warm technology is that we really want to use the technology to aid in the societal challenge and not just develop technology for technology's sake. All right, so that's the framing that we adopt uh, when we look at warm technology. Of course, both need to uh, occur to advance science. The final one, this is uh, uh, someone, in a, uh, as you can see, in a night robe. Um, I can ask you, what kind of occupation do you think this person has? Of course, it has to do with dementia. This is actually something, uh, someone who is working in a night shift for people living with dementia. And instead of wearing the white uniform that you often see in care environments or in hospitals, this person is wearing a nightgown. Because when a person with dementia, who is maybe confused, awakes and sees a person taking care of them, also having sleeping clothes on, the association with sleeping is much more clear. And the confusion is not uh, there of where the person uh, is at that moment or what's supposed to happen at the moment. All right, we call this perspective, we call that person-centered care. It comes from, uh, from dementia care, actually. And we try to adopt that person-centered perspective in our research as well. So this together 
leads to kind of starting point for warm technology. That's for us uh, avoiding complexity. It's uh, technology as a means, not as a goal in itself, and to really work person-centered. And like I said before, work with the people. On top of that, we did a, a small analysis in an article, uh, can be found online uh, by Eisenstein et al. And uh, what we did in this is to look also at the temptations that we might have as engineers, as technologists. And we found this list of five things that people that are working with technology sometimes make, and we try to discuss, like, maybe that's also a point of reflection for those uh, people working with technology. And this, this list of so these five, so one I already mentioned a little bit, it's technology um, uh, uh, screens are used in technology sometimes without the uh, uh, reflection, if that is a suitable means there. Also, we sometimes, as engineers, think that technology is a solution for everything. But you really have to be careful with putting a technical solution on every problem that you find and really put it there where it can make a difference. The third one is sensors everywhere. Because we can measure something, so we sometimes also measure everything that we can. But of course, there again, you have to be careful when it really makes sense to measure something and when maybe uh, that's not needed. Fourth one is that sometimes natural interpretation uh, technologies are um, uh, proposed to support people with cognitive challenges, like people with dementia. Think of, for example, uh, Google Home. But when you see interactions, uh, uh, I actually saw a very funny video, a video of an Italian lady that I can uh, share later with you. But uh, uh, you see that actually interacting with the devices is not so easy. Yeah, so it's really something that you need an understanding of the technology before you can understand that feedback. And then the fifth one is that we sometimes integrate technology solutions like we do in our smartphone all in one device. But when we work in this setting of people with dementia, that's not always the most suitable direction to take. So this together comes to our framing of warm technology. And it's really based on a socially just and inclusive perspective to address these societal challenges. And in this, we view people as unique individuals, so we don't try to look at the disease as a whole, but really to see what people need in the different phases and steps and, and manifestations of, uh, of dementia, and to really contribute with our technology to the warmth between people. All right? So that's where we come from when we uh, talk about warm technology. Um, we proposed it last year, so for us it's not a checklist that we have that we can offer you and then you have warm technology. No, it's really a mindset. It's really a way of looking at technology where you might, as an engineer, as a designer, make different decisions for your technology. Well, then an example. Um, the reason why I am so, uh, well, I'm kind of into this field uh, that started about 10 years ago is because my uh, grandpa had dementia, and he um, uh, was living at home. I was then studying industrial design, and there I found actually there was very little technology on the market to support my grandpa in a proper way. Um, so for me, that led me to, to start working on this, and one of the things I developed, uh, inspired by, by my grandpa uh, during my PhD, was to address um, the wandering behavior. Uh, this is something that happens to people in early dementia to mid-dementia, uh, and also in late, is that they might get lost in public space. So that means that when they go outside of their door, they don't know where they currently uh, are. And what we found is that the solution that is currently on the market, a GPS tracker, very simple ones are available, uh, is actually um, uh, um, uh, used to give a tag to a person with dementia, and then the environment is able to track this person. All right, so then the caregivers or the family members, they might be able to track and trace the person with dementia. But what we forget in that solution is that the person with dementia is not included in that solution. All right, so the person with dementia is still lost while having this GPS tracker on. So we thought we can do that uh, better, and we came uh, with the homing compass as a uh, design solution. And this is a compass. And the only functionality that it has is that it always points home. Very simple feature, but with this one, the technology can still be traced by GPS, and the person can also have a look on it, uh, him or herself, to find the way back home. 
all right? So this is a way of looking at technology that is more inclusive and where we can actually support people with dementia directly in, uh, in the problems that they experience. And that's really something what we want to do with, uh, with warm technology. All right, a little bit then how do we get to some a solution uh, like this? Maybe for the designers in the, in the room, this is a familiar uh, kind of picture, but we go through a design process that is iterative of nature. So that means that we have different stages where we engage with people, where we prototype our technology, and then we, uh, uh, together with the target group, we try to find a way to get to a fitting uh, solution at the end. So here are, uh, is a bit of a simplified model, four phases, which has an explore phase, a design phase, which is more conceptualizing, an evaluation phase where we really put the technology in the field, and then further along the implementation and the scaling. All right, and this research is really taking place early in this design process, where we explore, where we really try to find together with people with dementia what problems are most urgent to address, and then in the conceptualization phase, and the uh, evaluation phase, we really try to kind of almost trail an arrow towards finding a good fit. Um, this might sound a little bit abstract, but how does that then look in practice? So here I have a few snapshots of that process, how it went for that uh, compass that we designed. So uh, above you see a very simple uh, wooden uh, structure we created as a first experience prototype. It still needed a cable to work just to get a feeling of how would it be to hold a compass in your hand, all right? And also, in this first version, we had a lot of features included. For example, if we have the technology there, you can also make a, a, phone, uh, a phone call uh, connection. Or maybe you can also put a Google Maps projection so that it's also a navigation device for uh, finding uh, other places. So we, we were over-featuring the system, and by making it in a prototype, you can actually see together with the target group, so we had workshops with people with dementia, together with them you can find if the ideas you have actually work. So we work really close to these people, and with them we eventually came to this very simple version at the end, so every iteration we had to strip away more features because they still didn't fully understand it, and then we came to this uh, final design. And the good news is that in the uh, beginning of 2022, we will have new prototypes of the system. We now have only one that is carefully locked away in my home. Um, but we have a, we're going to uh, make a series of them, and then we are going to field test this kind of final version to see what the impact is for people with dementia. Well, how does then session like that, for example, uh, look? So it can be very simple, just putting people uh, uh, together and take them through what we call a co-design session. So that means that we really try to also make design decisions together with, uh, with the target group. All right, so this is one example. Uh, and what I want to do now is to show you uh, very briefly, we don't have so much time, very briefly take you through three more examples of things uh, that we have researched, that we have uh, worked on, and to give you a little bit of an idea of the range of things that we uh, develop, with our, uh, develop with our team. And the first one is the uh, Vita Pillow. And Vita is developed together with the Pleiade innovation, uh, innovation team, with um, uh, care organization Pleiade. So we also really seek those collaborations um, with care partners. And what we developed with them together is a pillow that by pressing these soft sensors, uh, uh, one sensor under each of the graphics, uh, personal sound is played. And I have a short video to show you how that works. presentation crash, so that's not really uh, the idea. So let me quickly try to restart that. 
never a good idea to run PowerPoint on a Mac. But um, so um, what the video uh, tried to portray is that when people put their hand on these soft sensors, then um, uh, the music is being played. And what we uh, developed, I'll quickly try to get back there. I think I'll have to skip the, uh, the video. Um, is it like this? So what we um, um, uh, developed is a system also where the caregivers and the family members can upload the favorite music of, uh, of the people. So we really use the context of the family, the knowledge of the family about a person, and then we make it available towards the persons with dementia. So this is really something for the later stages of dementia, which you could already see a little bit. And you really see a connection that is made in the brain of people in these later stages when they hear their familiar music. Because new, uh, hearing this familiar music makes new connections in the brain, and people are often, after an engagement with this music, they, are, um, uh, they, they know more, their memories come back a little bit, they recognize people again. So this is what you can see um, when people engage with music. I think I'm quickly going to skip this one. Um, then, uh, to give a little bit of a snapshot, so how does that design process towards that pillow then look? So here you can see, again, a few uh, snapshots of that process. So it's really an iterative process where we make things, bring them to practice, and then go back to the, to the drawing board. For example, on the left you see a really simple first prototype of a sleeping pillow with a Bluetooth speaker. So really, already on that stage, we go to the context to understand how people respond to it. And there you can see that, uh, in this case, people really responded well. They really liked it. They, they felt it nice to interact with a, something like a pillow. And from there, we iterated further towards the version that you just saw. And here's also a little bit of an interface on the back of the pillow. And you, there you can set the volume and then the... Um, uh, the uh, pictogram of a person can be used to cycle through the personal soundscape, so to say, to find the one matching the person you want to find at that moment. So that's a really simple way where the person, uh, persons working in care don't need to go to a complex system to find still this personal uh, uh, sounds for their, uh, the people they care for. All right, so here you see also in the designing of these kind of more complex systems really have to think about how it can be as simple as possible for the persons with dementia, for their family members who are often also older, but also for the people working uh, in care. Another example. So this one is a design process again for more the longer, uh, uh, for the long-term care uh, stage of dementia, where uh, the pillow is also positioned. Um, where we designed uh, some, also together. So here you see a snapshot of where we had a workshop with people in care to see what their needs were and what materials they would like to use in this setting. And here I have another video, and uh, let's brace ourselves that this one works. Yeah, something is uh, wrong. I'm very sorry for that. Um, they can be viewed on our uh, website as well, so maybe we can add that link. I never had this problem before, but you're not helped uh, with that. Um, so some, uh, I will show a picture in a moment of some, then I can explain what it, uh, what it does. Um, here, one second. Uh, apologies for that. So SAM is a um, kind of a small table robot that we designed. It's a small sphere. There you can see them. And the sphere is st standing on the table in uh, long-term care. What you often see in this setting is that people with dementia, they, when they are engaged with, they, they, yeah, they show kind of emotions, they show responses. But when they are just sitting at the table, they can be sometimes a bit apathic. And um, that's really something that the care professionals feel a bit guilty about because they don't have the time to continually see, engage with these people. So what we found uh, here, it's, it might be nice to have a kind of um, uh, general form, generically formed 
table body that is interactive, so you can pick it up, you can shake it, you can, s you can stroke it, you can uh, 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 tap it, and it responds with light and sound. So it's almost like a small agent at the table. Also, there's always two. So when one is picked up, the other one sounds, uh, shows, for example, behavior of being jealous, also wanting to be picked up. And uh, by having this, it creates a little bit of a social situation of people with dementia among themselves. So we use the technology to invite people to interact, to respond. Um, we just, a few weeks ago, we showed them again to uh, some people with dementia, and they were really just by you know, having something interactive, you really felt that they st were stimulated. And you really see, and also the video showed that, but that's uh, for later then. Um, but you, we can really see there uh, how these people respond. And they need just a little bit of a trigger before that they can kind of go on with this, uh, with this engagement. So this is again a bit for the later stages. There you see you can use technology to... Um, yeah, you cannot really help a person with dementia in terms of, um, uh, uh, of their disease, of course, but you can provide them comfort in living with dementia. And that's what we try to do with the Vita Pillow and with, uh, with Sam as well. It's also a tool that we offered for care, so they can also use it when someone is maybe, um, well, a bit restless, for example. They can use it as a tool. And one of the biggest findings of this study was actually that the people in care being involved there they actually were much more open to other designs and other innovations after this track. So for them, it opened kind of an opportunity from which they, uh, uh, they went on with new things further. So, so it's also really important that we let people in care know what's actually possible. And that's also, I think, our, uh, our task with the center, for example. All right, then uh, the last case. How long do I still have? A few minutes, maybe? Yeah, so last case I want to show you, it's again for people in the more early stages uh, with dementia. Uh, Christmas is coming up, you can imagine sitting around the table, having contact with your family. Maybe with the corona uh, it's a little bit less now, but we actually wanted to see how communication happens in uh, people living with dementia. And what you actually see, okay, these gatherings, they, they work, then of course the person with dementia is included, but often when there is distant communication via phone, for example, or via WhatsApp or whatever, um, then often the caregiver, so the partner, for example, is the gateway of social communication to the person with dementia. And of course the person with dementia by that feels a little bit distant from the family, and we wanted to design something uh, to help in this situation. Uh, and what we designed was the Living Moments system. And what Living Moments does, it offers an application for family members to send messages, but then on the side of the person with dementia, they are printed as postcards. So that means the only thing they have to do is to pick up this card that is uh, in their digital uh, inbox, so to say, and they, uh, of the physical inbox, I have to say, they take it, and then they can read the message and look at the picture that is sent. And then afterwards, they can also put the postcard in the tablet and they can hear a voice message or they can see a video that is uh, also sent along with that. And by this, the person with dementia is empowered again to interact with their family members because with the buttons, they can also give a reply back. And we designed it in such a way that we have different reply options based on the abilities that the person has. So it can go from complex as typing a message, that's really for early, early stages of people with dementia, up to making a selfie uh, or sending just a like button back, just to give a little bit of a reply, hey, I really enjoyed that message that you sent me. I have some videos again, so we'll see how that works. Um, so here you see how the uh, printed file is then uh, taken, and then uh, the person puts it back uh, on top of the tablet, and then the video that is attached uh, will be shown. As you can see, um, we saw in our study all kinds of diverse messages being sent, sometimes about the mundane things in life, and sometimes about the very special moments, for example, like a, like a wedding. And then, if possible, uh, people are uh, able to still reply, and they can press, for example, the, um, uh, the option to just send an emotion uh, back. They get four options. And they can, for example, just send a like back, and then the person receives that in their digital application. 
So in this way, we really try to design something that is fitting for both the family members. For them, it's something that they are used to, digital communication. And then we adapted the part of the person with dementia also in line with their abilities. And by this, we could actually create a really nice way to facilitate uh, social communication. Now, I have been talking about technology and, and these examples, and I try to inspire you a little bit with what you can do when you take this frame of warm technology. Um, but we always should go back to the people uh, and see if it works for them. If it's really, it's so easy to overstep this perspective and to become enthusiastic about a certain technology, but always we have to go back to them and see if it really uh, benefits their experience and their lives. And uh, in the studies that we did with these examples, we could see that. Uh, of course, we are just at the beginning of our research, so we just are trying to create things, investigate them, and get a bit more grip on this term, warm technology. Uh, and also, it's an invitation to you. If you are interested to work with us, uh, let us know, and then we can, uh, uh, we can see what you can uh, do to, to help us in our research to find these warm technology solutions um, for people with, uh, with dementia and their surroundings. Um, so I already showed this center that we set up. Uh, you can find more at www.ecdt.nl. Uh, the videos <laughs> can also be found there. Sorry that they didn't, uh, didn't work today. Uh, and we really, oh, it's in Dutch, sorry, but we really try to bring together researchers from different disciplines uh, in our center to really you know, work together from all these uh, perspectives that are available here at the university and uh, to bring uh, together solutions to uh, well, to really have an impact uh, on dementia. So I hope I got you a little bit excited for this topic, warm technology, working on this important societal challenge of uh, dementia. And there's several ways that you can get involved in our research and in our center. First one is that we have an event on the 24th of February focused on design, dementia and AI. So you're invited for that one. We also have a conference uh, that we co-organize uh, uh, that is in September 2022. The submission deadlines for student work or for academic work is uh, in March. And uh, we really want to also encourage students to show their work there with other researchers from, uh, from around the world. So get in touch with us if you have something that you want to share there. It can be really small. It can be uh, something you did at home. For example, it's uh, really no problem. And then the last one, I think it's really interesting that we are going to launch a student team on this topic, on warm technology, and we're also going to uh, launch a warm technology challenge. And if you have interest in that, um, we are still setting it up, so we will get the communication out very soon. But if you're interested in that, please let us know at our email address, which is dementia at toe.nl. And uh, that was it uh, for me. Thank you very much for, uh, for listening. Yes, Rens, thank you so much for these uh, inspiring examples of uh, warm technology. Uh, we have a few minutes left for questions, so I'm first going to take a look in the room and see if there are already questions up there. The light is very bright, I'm sorry. Or if there are any questions for our online viewers, because we have quite a few today. Um, if not, let me start off, uh, Rens, by asking, um, you're working closely together with uh, people with dementia. I can imagine that's um, quite a, a broad group uh, and maybe not always um, consistent in their behavior, uh, depending on where they are maybe in, in terms of progression. So what are the biggest challenges working with this group? Yeah, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, um, what, what I mentioned in the beginning with the person-centered approach is that we try to avoid seeing dementia as a kind of cohort to find average kind of characteristics of the disease. Mm -hmm. We really try to also facilitate the diversity in this group in the designs. For example, the Vita Pillow has a very personal offer that we can design as such. Uh, to do that, we, for example, have uh, on Wednesday afternoons, we, together with the Katholieke Bond for Ouderen, we have an, a session with people with dementia. Also, students are invited there uh, to really, from our side, facilitate that engagement with people so that you can also understand the diversity of this of this group. So yeah. we, we find uh, it's indeed very challenging, but we try to facilitate that uh, uh, by understanding the differences, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah, it's, uh, it's also very interesting, I can imagine, to have 
such close contact with these people. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's actually uh, uh, sometimes people when they have never worked with this group or they don't have any um, uh, experience with it in their family, they might be a bit hesitant to, to join these sessions or to engage, but after the first engagement, in every case that I've seen now, people are very enthusiastic because they see the person rather than the, the disease. And, and by engaging, you can actually much better design these, uh, yeah, design these technologies. Yeah. Great, thanks. Any questions at the moment? Yes, I see two over here. We have a catch box. Let me check online as well. Go ahead. Um, yeah, thanks uh, for the presentation. Um, I really love the pillow also, and I was wondering, are there any initiatives to work with smell as it also triggers memories? Are there any plans in that direction? I'm just going to repeat the question because I'm not sure if the mic was on, but your question was, are there also opportunities for using smell as a feature? Yeah, a very good question. Smell is indeed a very strong way to, uh, to activate uh, uh, memory. We have actually on our website, there was one project of a student uh, worked with smell, uh, designing the smell library. So there is some work we did on it, but we haven't done any uh, larger scale studies uh, with that yet, because scent is also really difficult to uh, kind of automate, to really uh, you know, bring it in an environment, it's really hard to then change the smell because it's already there. So it's not such an easy, uh, 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 yeah, not an easy way to work with smell, but I think definitely many opportunities are, uh, are there. Yeah. We have a very uh, concrete question about the compass that you showed. Um, and the question is, is it possible that they forget the function of the arrow in the compass and also what if they forget to bring the compass? Yeah, very good question. Yeah. And uh, that's also why we are going to do the field test. Uh, we did already a small field test where we saw that people, when instructed, um, they could really use it. Uh, also, what's interesting about the compass, they're not using it like we are using uh, Google Maps. It's really just to get a hint when they are lost. So it's really something that they sometimes don't look at, but when they're lost, they really you know, just peek. Oh, no, I need to go in that direction and then they know the, the way again. So um, uh, It's basically not like they forget that they brought it, which I can imagine. Yeah, but that's, ba that's also something, we, we have some ideas to design that also, yeah. so we can design it in such a way that it's uh, more easy to, to take it along when you go outside, but there's definitely stuff that we have to work on, uh, that, that we make sure that, that's, uh, yeah, that people bring it, yeah. Yeah, interesting. Thanks for that question. Um, anyone else? Yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, Rens, I was wondering, uh, you are now working with uh, people of the oldest generations who are not uh, that much used to uh, your technologies. Um, and I was wondering, uh, are we, when we get older, do you think we, get, uh, we are more used to your new technologies? Or do you think that because uh, technology also evolves, it will also be for us difficult to, to use those technologies in the future? Yeah. It's a very, uh, very good question. Eh? It's about uh, um, um, when we get older ourselves, what technology are we used to? What we know is that the formative years of a person are between 15 and 25, and the things we experience there are really uh, telling for what we can and accept uh, culturally later on in life. Uh, so we also sometimes go back to, uh, for example, the 60s, and really try to see what kind of things we can learn from that. You can also see it a little bit in the design of the living moments to try to use elements that were common in that time. So mm -hmm. my expectation is that this will lead also later when we are older again to an to a app. Maybe we have to use these old things that are called tablets when we are older. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, that is something that we know how to use. Uh, so, so, yeah, th I think sometimes people try to make the argument, just put it on a smartphone, in 20 years everyone can use them, and uh, no worry. But I think technology, as we know, as we see currently around us, keeps developing. So I think we need to keep special attention for uh, the olders, uh, older adults among, our, uh, among yeah. our society. Do you think there will also be, uh, will everything be warm technology in future, perhaps? In your ideal scenario? Or do we still <laughs> need cool technology, so to say? No, well, I like when I'm older, I would like to feel uh, warm, so to say. And that means in touch with people, in contact, and comfortable. I don't want to feel like this person hooked up to a, to a blood, uh, blood checker and interacting with 
this cold looking robot. So it's not that I think everything needs to be warm technology. Okay. I think it's just a new perspective that is at the moment really needed in the care domain, especially in dementia, also in other care domains. I think the hospital, nobody thinks, ah, oh, let's, let's go to the hospital because it's really nice there. No, it's, it's really, as it's a cold environment. It's also mm -hmm. for a reason a cold environment because it's really a functional environment. But I think this perspective can really bring something new there. Do you see uh, other fruitful uh, directions besides dementia research that you think you might go in future? Yeah, like I just said, hospital environments. I think okay. other long-term care environments, like uh, also um, uh, people with uh, NAH, uh, non-inquired brain injury, for example. So I think there's all kinds of cognitive challenges where long-term care is needed, where we can add something with, uh, with warm technology. Okay, great. Well, I think it's also an invitation to the students here, if you want to participate, like Ren said, do get in touch. Um, I would also like to mention, before we finish um, today's program, that originally, before the new COVID measures, we had planned to show tonight the movie The Father, also with an introduction by the center. Uh, unfortunately, we've had to cancel those plans for now, uh, but this movie will be shown Hopefully on the 23rd of March, it features Anthony Hopkins, uh, who is a person with dementia in that movie. So you're already invited to join us then in March also with maybe Renz or some of his colleagues. Um, Renz, thanks again for today for this introduction to worm technology. Renz Brankaert. <laughs> and for our online viewers, the use registration link will now appear in the chat. Uh, thank you all for uh, watching today and uh, we hope to see you again next time at Sturmi Generale. Thanks. <laughs>